Okay, I think we'll we'll make a start now. I think everybody's uh, joining us. So um, welcome to the Earth Program talk, uh, whatever time zone you may be in. My name is Gary, and I will be facilitating the talk today. Um, we have the great pleasure of hosting a very gracious and inspirational speaker, uh, the universally recognized and renowned Jane Goodall. Hi, Jane. Hello. Um, but before, before Jane starts, um, I've just got to go over a few um, of the program flow arrangements. So um, Jane, Jane will talk for about 30 minutes and we will have about 20 minutes for Q&A um, and finish at six o'clock. Um, please show your faces um, if you can, because this makes the gathering a little bit more um, personal. Um, the talk is part of a series of talks uh, with international ecological speakers. The Kadori Earth Programme is an initiative co-created by KFBG and a network of collaborators and volunteers. It provides life transforming experiences that help to reconnect people with themselves, each other and nature with the key aim of helping to cultivate resilience in the face of global, global challenges. Um, the talk will be recorded and we provide translation facilities. Your questions can be typed in English or Chinese. And if you have any problems, please send a message in the chat box to our support team who will try to help. We will have time for some questions after the talk, but due to the limited time, we would like all questions to be passed via the chat box, please. Um, I'll try to read out as many questions as I can. And please, please keep your questions uh, quite succinct and short, short and clear. So that will help us uh, with the um, time issue. Okay, um, so we are, we are very fortunate to have Jane with us today as she is in great demand for her wisdom and encouragement at a time of increasing environmental and political stress. I won't run through Jane's bio as it can be found in many places on the internet. Um, and to be honest, actually in the time I've got, I would not do justice to the amazing life Jane has lived and all the accomplishments she has achieved. So without further ado, I will pass over to Jane who will talk to us about inspiring hope through action. Over to Dr. Jane Goodall. Well, thanks, thanks so much. And uh, because of time constraints, let me just say to start with that I was actually born loving animals. And I want to pay tribute to my amazing mother. Of course, when I was growing up in England, uh, just before World War II, I was born. And, you know, there was no television and loving animals. I learned from being out in nature. We've got a garden with squirrels and, and um, you know, little birds and insects and so on. And from books, I loved books. And my mother used to bring books in the library about animals mm. because we couldn't afford new ones. And uh, it was when I was 10 years old, having just read and learned about Tarzan of the apes, and falling in love with him and thinking he married the wrong Jane. <laughs> well, um, I knew there wasn't a Tarzan, but that's when my dream began. I will grow up, go to Africa, live with wild animals and write books about them. Everybody laughed. How will you do that? You don't have money. Africa's far away and you're just a girl. But my mother, no, she said, if you really want to do something like this, you're going to have to work really hard, take advantage of every opportunity. And if you don't get up, give up, hopefully you find a way. Well, cutting out how it happened, let me just say, as most of you know, I did get to Africa. I was 23 years old and I was fortunate enough to hear about and meet Dr. Lewis Leakey, famous paleontologist. And he was the one who made my dream come true. He seemed to understand that my love of animals and nature was real. 
and he offered me the opportunity to go to what is now Gombe National Park in Tanzania, where there were groups of chimpanzees living along the lake shore of Lake Tanganyika. And when I got there, it was a bit worrying because there was only money for six months. And for four of those months, the chimpanzees took one look at me and vanished into the forest. And I was getting really worried. But then one chimpanzee, whom I named David Greybeard, began to lose his fear. And one day I watched him breaking off grass stems and using them to push into the termite nest, pull it out slowly, eat off the termites with his mouth. And he picked leafy twigs and he had to strip the leaves to make that into a tool. That was immensely exciting because back then, scientists thought humans and only humans used and made to tools. And so National Geographic came in at that point and offered to fund the research when the six months ran out. So then I got to really be out there in the forest. I learned how chimpanzees are so like us in so many ways, which I don't have time to go through here, but there are many, many books about <clears throat> ways in which they resemble us biologically and behaviorally, like kissing, embracing, holding hands, social, socially complex society, long bonds between mothers and infants, male dominance, very territorial, sadly capable of violence and war, killing, also having an altruistic, compassionate side, just like us. So Leakey made me go and get a degree. When I started, I had not been to college. We couldn't afford it. And he sent me to Cambridge University to do a PhD. What? Oh, that was a strange noise, like a cat. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, whatever. Um, so when I got there, I was told by the professors I'd done everything wrong. I shouldn't have given the chimps names. I couldn't talk about them having personality, mind, or emotion. And I knew that they were wrong because I had a wonderful teacher as a child, and that teacher was my dog, Rusty. Anybody who's had a dog, a cat, a bird, I don't care what, knows we are not the only thinking, feeling beings on the planet. And so I eventually got my PhD. But the exciting thing for me was that when science began to acknowledge, because of my research, because of the film that was made, that we are indeed part of and not separate from the rest of the animal kingdom. This has opened the door for people to study animal intelligence. And it's just amazing. It's not just chimpanzees and other apes and elephants and dolphins, but it's pigs and rats and it's octopuses and it's birds. And this is, uh, we're now beginning to see who animals are in relation to us. We are part of, I repeat, the rest of the animal kingdom. So I went back to Gombe, started a research station, which by the way is still operating. It's now in its 62nd year. And I had the best time of my life. I was able to be out in the forest, learning about the chimpanzees, learning about the ecosystem, how every plant and animal species has a role to play, and realizing that as one of these interconnected species disappears from an ecosystem, it's as though a, a thread is pulled from a spider web of life. And if too many threads are pulled, the ecosystem will collapse. And this is where we must realize we are dependent on the natural world, 
for food, for water, for air, for everything. But we depend on healthy ecosystems. And as everybody knows, these ecosystems are being increasingly destroyed all around the world. So um, I could have stayed in Gombe forever. Mm. But in 1986, I went to a conference of people by then studying chimps in six different countries of, in Africa. And we had a session on conservation and it was a shock everywhere. Forests were being destroyed and chimpanzee numbers were decreasing. So I went to that conference as a scientist and I left as an activist. And so I didn't quite know what to do. I just knew I had to do something. So I got money to visit six different field study sites around Africa. And I learned a great deal about the plight of the chimpanzees, the bushmeat trade, the commercial hunting of wild animals for food, the destruction of the habitat, either by foreign logging companies or local people. And I learned about the shooting of mothers so that their infants could be sold locally as pets or to the international illegal wildlife trafficking to be sent to other countries as pets or to train for entertainment. The first time I saw an infant chimpanzee being sold in a market in Congo, it, it was just one of the most moving moments in my life. This little chimpanzee, about one and a half years old, curled up on top of a tiny wire cage with a string around his waist. And his eyes were glazed. It looked as though he was close to death. And so I went over and gave the little soft sound of chimpanzee greeting. <laughs> to my amazement, this little being sat up and reached out towards me. And it was heartbreaking. I couldn't buy him. That would just perpetrate the trade. But fortunately, I was able to persuade the Minister of Environment to, to come with me, to, to send a policeman with me. And we went back at night. The market was deserted. There was just this lonely little figure tied up to his cage and we rescued him. And that was the start of the sanctuary programs in Africa. And we managed to start sanctuaries in Uganda, in Burundi, in uh, Congo, Congo Brazzaville, that's the <coughs> Republic of Congo, and in Uganda and in South Africa, where there was a big pet trade. And the largest sanctuary today in Africa is run by the Jane Goodall Institute. It's Chimpunga, Chimpunga Wildlife Sanctuary. And one of the chimpanzees that I had met in, in, in Congo, in Brazzaville, was Gregoire. Gregoire must have been some 50 years old. He was gaunt and thin. And I vowed I would get him out of that tiny bear cage. And he was one of the chimpanzees to go to our Chimpunga sanctuary. Another chimpanzee, La Vieille. I met her very close to Chimpunga in what was originally a holding place where animals were kept to be shipped out to Europe. And La Vieille was in a tiny bear cage. The door was broken. She could have come out, but even when food was placed outside, she would not leave that cage. I don't know what had happened to her. She, we rescued, and she came to Chimpunga, and it was two whole years before she came out of her night cage into the big open space where all the other chimps were, which led out to a big outside forested enclosure. But in the end, La Vieille became a, a, a sort of um, foster mother. And at one time, six of our newly adopted infants rescued when their mothers had been shot, looked to her for comfort. And she would walk around sometimes with three babies 
clinging to her back. It was very moving and a wonderful way to end her life. There are so many stories, but we don't have time for them now. So, um, skipping over these stories, we have another sanctuary in South Africa, Chimp Eden. One little chimp arrived. He had all his body hair shaved. He'd been covered in perfume. He was dressed in a little suit and in a suitcase he had other clothes. It was just so sad. It took him a very long time to interact with other chimpanzees. So as I was learning about the plight of these chimpanzees, I was also learning about the plight of the African people. And it came to a head when I flew over the tiny Gombe National Park, which had been part of a forest stretching across equatorial Africa. And by the late 1980s, I saw a tiny island of Gombe forest surrounded by bare hills, more people living there than the land could support, too mm. poor to buy food from elsewhere, cutting down the trees to make more land to grow more food or to make money from charcoal or timber. And that's when it hit me. If we don't find ways of helping these people to find ways of making a living without destroying the environment, we can't save chimps, forests, or anything else. And so the Jane Goodall Institute began our program, Take Care, or Takari, which is a very holistic program involving scholarships to keep girls in school, uh, microfinance opportunity for especially women to start their own small environmentally sustainable businesses. Uh, we provide family planning and so much else. And that program began in the villages around Gombe. It's now in 104 villages throughout Chimp Range in Tanzania. And it's in six other African countries. And the people now understand that protecting the environment <clears throat> isn't just for wildlife, it's for their own future. Mm -hmm. They have become our partners in conservation. There's a whole book out now about this, Local Voices, Local Choices. It's on the internet. So uh, by this time, and we're now still in the 1980s, uh, the beginning of Takari, I was finding more and more young people losing hope, even back then, seeing what we're doing to harm the planet. And I began talking to these young people. They're all around the world. And they were either angry or depressed or just not seeming to care. Why? Oh, they said, you're compromising our future and there's nothing we can do about it. We have been stealing their future. We are still stealing their future, but it's not too late to do something about it. And that's when our Roots and Shoots program began. And it started with 12 high school students in Tanzania. It's now in 66 countries around the world, including China uh, and, and Hong Kong and other Eastern countries and all over America and Europe, growing in the Middle East and across Africa. And basically, it's a program where young people from kindergarten through university choose for themselves three projects which will relate to their age, their environment, their religion, uh, their culture. One project will help people. One project will help other animals. One project will help the environment. And these young people, once they get involved and they choose something they're passionate about, like clearing litter or planting trees or whatever, um, they roll up their sleeves and they take action. And they are changing the world even as we speak. They're my greatest reason for hope. So I think we all know how we're harming the planet, how we're polluting destroying forests, polluting the ocean, um, factory farming, 
which keeps billions of animals in cruel conditions. And they're polluting the atmosphere with methane gas, which is another of the greenhouse gases, the main one being carbon dioxide from fossil fuel burning and so on. And these gases are trapping the heat of the sun like a blanket around the globe. And that's leading to climate change. The industrial farming with its heavy reliance on chemical pesticides and herbicides is having a terrible effect on biodiversity. Insects are being killed, birds are being killed, small mammals are being killed, and it's killing the very soil on which we all depend. And in so many other ways, we're harming the environment. So isn't it weird that we clearly are the most intellectual being on the planet. I mean, animals way more intelligent than we thought, but we've designed rockets that reach Mars. And we're talking, I'm in England, um, talking to Hong Kong and other places around the world. I mean, no animal could do anything like that. So how come we are destroying our only home? I think there's a disconnect between clever, clever head and heart, love and compassion. And I think only when head and heart work in harmony can we attain our true human potential. So um, we have many problems to overcome. A few of them, climate change, loss of biodiversity, poverty, unsustainable lifestyles, discrimination, cruelty, conflict, war. So is there hope? People are always asking me if there's hope. My greatest reason for hope is young people, not only Roots and Shoots, other youth groups. Once young people understand the problems and are empowered to take action, they're changing the world. They're changing the thinking of their parents and grandparents and their friends. <laughs> And now, because we began in 91, many of our Roots and Shoots members are out in the big wide world. They're decision makers and they hang on to the values they attained during their time in Roots and Shoots. The main one is respect. respect for other people, respect for the environment. So my second reason for hope is our brain where scientists are beginning to create technology such as renewable energy and other ways of living in harmony with the natural world. And individuals are beginning to think daily about their environmental footsteps. What do they buy? Did it harm the environment when it was made? Is it cruel to animals? Is it cheap because of unfair wages in another country? And so, our brains are beginning to try and reverse the harm that we've committed to at least slow down climate change and loss of biodiversity. My third reason for hope, the resilience of nature. Places we have utterly destroyed, given time and perhaps some help, nature will come back. At first with a few um, little plants and then the insects will come followed by birds, and gradually the habitat uh, will return. Not the same, but much the same. And my good example here for this talk, I described the bare hills around Gombe in the late 1980s. Well, if you fly over the area today, the bare hills have gone throughout the whole Gombe ecosystem and beyond because the people now understand the need to protect the environment. And of course, in all the schools around Gombe and throughout this whole area, there are roots and shoots programs, young people learning to understand the importance of the environment, to understand that animals like us have feelings and are sentient beings capable of feeling fear, and pain. And then there are so many other examples all around the world of habitats that have been restored. And now there's a lot of tree planting going on 
and protection of forests and coral reefs and so on. Animals on the very brink of extinction, if people care enough, can be given a second chance. And many stories about that. And I know that Kaduri Farms is doing a lot to help rescue animals. And in some cases, this will help their continued survival. And then my fourth and last reason for hope is what I call the indomitable human spirit. The people who tackle what seems impossible and won't give up and so often succeed. And one example I love, it, it's, it's not just people tackling environmental problems. It's not just people tackling social problems. It's also people who are born with, with terrible physical disabilities, and yet they lead lives that inspire those around them. The one example I will give is a man called Chris Cock. He's Canadian. He was born with no arms, just little tiny stumps and no legs, just a sort of flipper-like thing coming out of his thigh. Chris goes around the world by himself on a skateboard. If you sit level with him either on the floor or he pops up onto the sofa, you're looking into a face alive with intelligence, intelligence and the love of life. He is one of my heroes, but there are others. And in our Roots and Shoots program and other such programs, there are young people learning about their place in life, learning that they are part of the natural world. And so that's my message for you today. And I have managed on the dot to stop at, at uh, for my time, 10.30. So thank you all very much for listening. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, your, actually, your mention of Bear Hills um, reminds us in Hong Kong here that not so long ago, we had Bear Hills as well, and only through protection and really a, a kind of a will to, to, to want um, the environment to improve will, will things get better. And we've actually seen a lot of the biodiversity improve um, with the protection of our mountains. Um, I think we'll move straight on to the, the questions. Uh, please, please remember to write your questions um, in the chat box um, in Chinese or English, and I'll read out um, as many as I can. Um, perhaps, perhaps to start the, uh, the, the, the question flow off, maybe I can ask you a question first, um, Jane. Um, now, are there any sort of recommended analogies that you use uh, when you're talking to people, uh, talking to the public, to to sort of sort of immediately connect them with the way that their lifestyles are damaging a nature, so that they actually go away feeling they can make a difference, they can go home and do something that will help um help nature to to recover or to protect it are there any any specific ones well i think one that i mentioned is shopping when you shop if you think about what you buy and where it came from mm. and in this as in so many other ways it's young people who are training their parents in how to live a life more in harmony with nature. And so there are, there is, you know, I try to reach people's hearts with stories because if you start arguing with a climate denier, for example, mm. they don't listen, they right. just argue. But if you can tell a story to reach the heart, and there was one story that I wanted to tell it doesn't really fit in with your question, but I'm going to tell the story anyway. Okay. It's a story about roots and shoots, which kind of symbolizes uh, the, the role that young people can play and how there is a window open to a better world. This was the very first group of roots and shoots 
in Democratic Republic of Congo. And it was a small group of about 12 children, uh, aged between 8 and 12. And for their project, they decided they wanted to grow trees on a hill that was once sacred, and now most of the trees had gone. So their mentor realized that actually the hill was much, much bigger than they thought. Uh, but he didn't want to damp their enthusiasm. So he went to a friend of his, a forester, and got little saplings. They got little digging implements. He had to go to the resident militia because it's the area where there's minerals and ask permission from the colonel who said, well, this seems stupid, but well, I suppose it's okay, but you'll have to have soldiers with you. So now imagine these 12 little children their saplings and their four big Congolese army officers with K uh, AK-47 rifles over their shoulders. Children are tired when they get there. The ground is hard. After a bit, the youngest little girl begins to cry. She can't dig her hole. After about five minutes, one of the soldiers laid his gun against a tree and went to help her. Within the next 10 minutes, all the guns were laid down and all the soldiers were helping the children to plant trees. And to me, that's a very, very moving story and it shows the power of young people. Yes. Okay, Jane, I've, I've got a question here. Uh, so let me read this question out. Um, can humans train their ability to communicate with animals? Um, is it an innate power? I think if people really want to learn, the secret is just letting your mind go free and spending time watching the animal. If you spend a lot of time watching, as I did with the chimps, um, you begin to understand how they're feeling. And if you understand how they're feeling, then you know how to interact with them. And of course, it's different for each species of animal. But uh, I don't know. I mean, I know I've always had a special relationship. Strange things happen. And I hope at the end we have time to show a video of one of the strangest things that happened to me with one of our chimpanzees in Chimpunga. But I've had a wonderful relationship with dogs. And it's very important to be calm, to keep your voice quiet, no sudden movements. And I watch people interacting with animals, especially their dogs, in such a horrid way sometimes. You know, I mean, for a dog, the world is smell. And yet you mm. see people walking their dog, the dog stops to sniff, which is his way of finding, or her, finding out about the world and yank, yank, yank on the lead. It's horrible. It upsets me. Okay, another um, question, Jane. Um, dear Dr. Jane Goodall, thanks for your wonderful talk. Um, you, um, I think it says, um, initiated a new methodology of ethology on animal behavioral research. Please share a bit more the challenges that you face. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> this is when I went to Cambridge University. And as I say, uh, or as I said, uh, I didn't have an undergraduate degree. And Leakey got me into Cambridge to do a PhD. I was the eighth person in Cambridge's hundreds of years history to be allowed to do a PhD without an undergraduate degree. And I met this wall of opposition, you know, that I'd done everything wrong. I was even told that the difference between us and other animals was one of kind. We were, we were separated on a peak and there was no way of crossing towards all the other animals. We were separate. We were the chosen ones. Huh. Well, it, I'm very happy that because of the chimp research, and the film that my then husband, Hugo Van Loek, took, which illustrated that everything I said was true, 
you know, the wonderful relationship between mothers and infants mm. and uh, males, males competing with each other for dominance, swaggering, standing upright, lips bunched in a furious scowl, waving their arms. They remind me so much of some human politicians. Mm. I will mention <laughs> no names, but just look <laughs> towards the United States. And um, so anyway, gradually, I didn't confront the scientists. I, that's never been my way. I just went on quietly talking about how chimps are, writing about it. And my supervisor was absolutely, he was one of the top three people who started ethology in Europe. And he, at first he was so stern and he told me I'd done everything wrong. <laughs> and then he came to Gombe and he wrote to me after two weeks and said, I learned more about animal behavior in this time at Gombe than the, all the rest of my life. And he helped me to think like a scientist while retaining my conviction of how animals are. And I love to learn how to think as a scientist. And he said, you know, Jane, I want you to be able to write in a way that doesn't leave you open to attack by the, you know, the hardline scientists who don't believe that we're related to animals in any way. And so I got my PhD and this did indeed open up a new era for animal research because initially they tried to make it into a hard science like physics or chemistry. Mm. You can't do that with animal behavior. You simply can't. Animals are individuals like we are. They have their feelings and they all act, react differently to different situations. So uh, I think I think that's probably what the questioner wanted to know. Right, Jane, I have a, a question from a nine-year-old uh, Charlie and um, Charlie's asking, or Charlie is curious to know how you would recommend that he and others perhaps of his age can act to help the environment? Well, obviously what I'm going to say is, I don't know where Charlie is, but wherever Charlie is, I urge you to join Roots and Shoots. If there isn't a group in your school, you can create one. You can look up rootsandshoots.org and find out how to do it. Your parents can help you, your teachers can help you and get into a group and then do something that you care about. You know, planting trees is very, very important, especially in mm. cities where we want to have lots of trees because it makes the city cooler. It stabilizes the soil so there's less flooding. It brings nature into the cities. And we know now that nature is really, really important for our psychological well-being. And so nature in cities, trees, insects, birds, really very important. So mm -hmm. Charlie, be in touch with us and let us know if you join Roots and Shoots. If you do, your life will change. Everybody says so. Yeah, thank you, Jane. I think Charlie is in, um, in Hong Kong. So uh, you have a Roots and Shoots in Hong Kong, don't you? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Okay, another question. How do you recharge and maintain optimism as our climate crisis and the loss of biodiversity seems to accelerate by the day? Well, let me answer. There's many different ways of answering, but the media is full of doom and gloom. And yes, we need to know that the situation is bad. We have to, but I've had the privilege of traveling around the world. I have met so many dedicated people doing amazing things. I've seen projects, you know, like your mountains in Hong Kong, mm. like the trees coming back around Gombe, like animal species. And there are so many amazing stories of animals that literally, I mean, the, the most, perhaps the most dramatic one is a little bird in New Zealand called the black robin. And it used to live on mainland New Zealand. And then because of cats and rats, 
and these birds are, you know, not, they weren't accustomed to predators. And at one point there were only 27 left. And this man was able to capture them and take them to an offshore island where there were no cats and rats. And it turned out only two birds of those 27 were fertile, one male and one female. And because of how he manipulated them in the wild, uh, taking eggs from the nest, knowing that they would probably make, uh, have a second um, brood, he did that three times. The last lot he left with the mother and father. And today there's around 500 black robins and mm. they're in different islands and so that species i mean that's the most dramatic california condors were at one time only 12 now there's 150 and so on all around the world okay um i have an, another young person eight year old 10 10 um i think you may have answered this already but she would like to know why do you love chimpanzees so much? So with three O's. <laughs> well, um, let me tell you, Tintin, that people always assume that my favorite animal is a chimpanzee. Well, actually, that's not true because chimpanzees are so like people. And there are some chimpanzees that I like much better than some people. But there's some people I like much better than some chimpanzees. And I, you know, I don't really think of chimpanzees as animals. They're more like people. My favorite animal animal is a dog because dogs are part of our life. Dogs somehow bring hope to people in desperate situations. Dogs can help sick children recover. Um, right now in this terrible war in Ukraine, and stray dogs are meeting up with soldiers in trenches and lifting the whole morale mm -hmm. of soldiers. So the reason I studied chimpanzees was because Louis Leakey told me, asked me if I would do that. I would have studied any animal. You know, I love so many animals, dogs best, but when it comes to wild animals, Oh, goodness, I love otters, I love elephants, I love, I just love so many, I love them all, actually. Okay, another question. Um, I was wondering how you might persuade people who argue that individual efforts to promote conservation and sustainability are insignificant in the face of structural constraints. <laughs> well, um, it's if if you're talking about one person's efforts uh, just like that, well, obviously that doesn't make any difference. But when you think that there are hundreds, thousands, or hopefully in the end millions of people all doing their individual efforts to protect the environment, to slow down climate change, then then you find that this is huge. It will have a huge impact on the planet today and on the future of our children and the animals with whom we should share the environment. So, you know, one person's effort alone wouldn't make any difference. Roots and shoots, and oh, actually, let me say, this is the way that I talk to people who come to me, many, saying, well, I've lost hope, I'm depressed, I look what's happening in the world, and I just feel there's nothing I can do as one person. And so I say, okay, you look around the world and you see all the problems and you feel depressed. All of us do, you can't help it. But don't think globally, act locally, act locally first. Act locally, find something you care about, persuade your friends to help you. And again, clearing litter is a very common one, planting trees is another but it could be volunteering in a soup kitchen. It could be raising funds for Ukrainian refugees or to help feed the pets that are abandoned in Ukraine. There's so many things that you can do. When you do those things, you feel better. When you feel better, you want to do more. You want to feel even better. And as this spirals, 
more and more people around you are inspired to join in. So then they too feel better. So my feeling is, and I'm not alone, other scientists be, believe this too, we do have a window of time. And it's only if we all get together and take action that we can hope to save the planet for our children and theirs. I have a question here from Emma, Ellie and Naomi. Uh, dear Jane, how many chimpanzees have you met before? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's over a thousand. I couldn't tell you, I haven't counted, but we've got some um, about 200 in our Chimpunga sanctuary. We've got over 50 in um, in Cape, in South Africa, in Chimbedan. Um, we started sanctuaries in Uganda, where I suppose I met about 60 chimps. We started a, a sanctuary in Burundi, rescued about 20 chimps. Gombe over the years, I've met, oh, I don't know, 500 chimpanzees over time. And then the, all the chimps in the different zoos all around the world that I've met. I don't know how many, lots. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another. Hi, Dr. Jane. Um, I am currently in high school and I'm part of the Roots and Shoots Club. Currently, we are brainstorming ideas on how to fight plastic pollution and spread awareness on the topic. What are your ideas on combating plastic pollution? Well, <clears throat> I think one of the worst plastic uh, pollutions comes from single use plastic. And in some countries, people have made petitions and they've, uh, you know, sent letters to government decision makers and had single use plastic banned. It was banned in Tanzania. But you can't always manage to get such a ban, which would be a huge help if you did. But spreading awareness, helping people to understand the harm that it's done. Uh, the, there are videos you can find that show what's happening with these huge plastic areas in the ocean. Help people understand plastic doesn't break down. It goes into whatever they call it, microplastic bits. And those are present all over in animals' bodies and so on. So another method is to clean up the rivers, to stop the plastic going into the ocean. And, you know... Those are the only ways I could think of right now. But that's what Roots and Shoots is about. You sit down, you talk with each other, you think of ways that you can help. If you think of more ways, please let me know because I'm always waiting to hear new ideas. Uh, talk to your parents and your teachers and see what you can come up with. Like this one young boy, I think he was Dutch, and he had this idea of putting out these huge floating rubber things. And it's now become an industrial method of collecting up the plastic. Oh, they've also discovered that there's a little, um, little, I can't remember what it's called, a wax worm or something, and it actually can eat plastic. Mm. Aurelia wants to know, Aurelia is seven years old, and she would like to know, how do I become a scientist like you? <laughs> well, <laughs> first of all, join Roots and Shoots, Amelia. And secondly, uh, you just have to learn about nature, um, do well at school, maybe today go to university, and read books, read books about animals and nature. And you know, if you continue, remember what my mother said to me, if you really want to do this, you'll have to work really hard, take advantage of every opportunity. And if you don't give up, you will find a way. And one from uh, Corinne. Um, nice to meet you, Jane. Uh, when we design and plan our city, we always do it only from the perspective of animals. Are there encouraging examples that you have come across? Uh, sorry, uh, always uh, designed from the perspective of human. 
but not of animals. humans. Ah, yeah, yeah. I, okay. I make yeah. No problem. Well, people are beginning to design cities which are green, and you know, cities cities should have more dog parks where dogs can run free and off their leash or lead. Um, and this again is something Roots and Shoots can sit down with architects and city planners and come up with new ideas. But basically it's to bring the green back into the city and to think about the needs of dogs and cats and, and little wild animals. There's more and more attention given to allowing wild animals into our cities and learning to live side by side with them rather than becoming all agitated. Like in Hong Kong, you've got those otters, haven't you? That come in from from the ocean, and or is that Singapore? No, that's Singapore. That's Singapore, yeah. But we do have otters here, actually. Yeah. We do, yeah. So we here in England, we have a beautiful fox who comes <laughs> through the garden sometimes in broad daylight, and we're learning here to live with the foxes. So that's what we have to do. And something about lost hope here. For people who have lost hope, what would you say to them to keep it up, keep, keep, um, keep hope up? Well, take action. Just do something. Hope. Hope is not about wishful thinking. Hope is about doing something and do something you care about, and then realize that all around the world, other people are doing, and that together you're making a huge difference. Okay, and what's your view on the possibility of animal languages, which is totally denied by Chomsky, for, for instance? Well, animals have a very complex communication system. And I know that Chomsky feels that animals don't have the same kind of communication we do, but I think that's belied by you know, chimpanzees who learn sign language um, and, and they can communicate ideas and invent words um, and then make a painting and you ask them what it is and they'll tell you. But my favorite example uh, is parrots. And there's mm. one parrot who lives in the Bronx and he was brought up not to be taught anything. He was free in the room with other parrots too. And his his partner, this woman, she just talked to him as though he was a baby. She got him captive bred, aged four months. And he now knows over 1,200 words. Mm. Uh, when I first met him, I went into the room. He was up on top of his big cage. I said, oh, Kesey, I've heard a lot about you. And of course, his mistress was thrilled I was going to meet him. <laughs> and she'd shown him pictures of me and, and videos. So this little tiny African grey looked down at me and said, that's Jane, got a chimp. <laughs> uh, and then one more story about Nkisi, and then I think we have to show the video, don't we? But one more Nkisi story. When he was uh, five years old, he loved playing with mechanical toys, you know, wind-up mm. toys, things like that. And so this... The lady, Amy, had rescued an iguana from a pet shop, but it died anyway. And she's very emotional. So this long lizard was laid out on the floor. She was burning candles and sweet grass and crying. So Kesey came over, had a look at this and said, try a new battery. <laughs> it is pretty amazing. Yeah. Should we do the video? Shall we have one more question and okay, then we we'll move time. move to yeah. the video? I think the video is about four minutes, isn't it? So well, let's one, one minute, one minute to introduce it. Ah, OK, so five minutes. So just one more question, which I think you can probably answer quite quickly. Dear Jane, do you keep your chimpanzee toy Jubilee now? Jubilee, yes, yes, Jubilee. yes. Jubilee is in an exhibition. He's in a bulletproof glass case, guarded day and night. He's now um, 80, 80, 86 years old. And right now he's in the US 
traveling around in this exhibit. So that's Jubilee, yes. Jubilee. Still, um, okay. And he still plays the musical box in his tummy. <laughs> okay. So if we, if we I, go on to the, uh, the video, is about a chimpanzee called Wunda. Hmm. And she came to Chimpunga uh, when she was a very small infant, wounded by the bullet that killed her mother. And our amazing veterinarian, Rebecca, who runs the sanctuary, managed to save her life. Then when she was about eight years old, she became really, really sick and close to death. And Rebecca again managed to save her with a chimp blood to blood transfusion. First time that was done right. in Africa. And Wunda was one of the chimpanzees who was moved to one of the three big forested islands given to us by the Congolese government. So the video shows Wunda about to be released. And I want you to think while you watch it of how I felt when this extraordinarily unexpected thing happened. I only met Wunda that day for the very first time. Okay, let's go to the video. This is a really exciting moment for me. The Jane Goodall Institute's Chimpunga Chimpanzee Rehabilitation Center in the Republic of Congo has for years been caring for infants whose mothers were killed, mostly for the illegal bushmeat trade. Many of them are now fully grown. Recently, we acquired three large forested islands on the beautiful Quilu River, where we can release many of the chimpanzees from our overcrowded center. In here is Wunda, and she nearly died, but thanks to Rebecca, she came back from the dead. And here she is about to come out into this paradise. She's the 15th chimpanzee to get her freedom here. And we hope ultimately to have about 60 on the island. Today is the first time I've met Wunda. I talked to her on the boat, trying to reassure her. She must have wondered what was happening. None of us could predict exactly what she would do once the cage door opened. It was a very, very touching moment. One of the most amazing things that's ever happened to me. The warmth of her embrace is something I shall never forget. For Wunda and all the other chimpanzees we're working to bring here, Chinzula Island will provide a wonderful forest home where they will be cared for and safe. Thank you, Jane. That was um, very, very moving. Uh, I know that the best part of rescue and rehab is always the release part. Um, that's always the, uh, the, the re really special moment when animals go back to the wild. Um, well, thank you very much for talking to us today, Jane. We had many more questions than we could possibly get through. Um, but I think we, we did a good job to try to get through as many as we could. Well, any um, special ones you can email to me. Right, okay. So so anybody who wants to to follow up can can email those. Yep. Okay, thank you, Jane. I, I'm just going to give a quick uh, reminder to everybody that, um, that uh, the next speaker in the Earth Pro Program series will be the
tri tribal elder John Quano, who was very um, interesting, very, very interesting. He has a very good sense of humor, John, as well. Okay, so um, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, and for a special thank you for those that made donations. Um, a questionnaire will be sent around shortly uh, to, if you have a chance to, to answer that, that would be great. Um, and have a great evening or day, wherever you may be, and we hope to see you again. So goodbye from me and the hardworking support team here at Kadori. Thank you.